I'm Jack Gansel and welcome to the Embedded Muse video blog which is a companion to my free Embedded Muse e-newsletter. In part one of the series I looked at the Siglent SDS 1102 CML 100MHz digital oscilloscope. This is part two and we're going to look into some of the features a little bit more deeply. The scope does allow us to take all kinds of automatic measurements and it's really quite a deep variety of measurements that we'll do. I mean here's an example. For, I can set each of these buttons to be a different measurement. So here for example I can decide if I want to measure voltage on any of the sources, any of the channels. I'm using channel 1. You can measure all these different kinds of voltages. Peak to peak, max, min, average, uh, you name it. It's very extensive. Uh, I can do that for each of the channels. You can uh, do the same thing in time. Take a bunch of different kinds of measurements, period, frequency, width, all of that stuff. In addition to all the measurements that it takes, it does support cursors, as do most scopes nowadays. And it's a pretty, pretty standard sort of setup. You can set cursors for time, voltage. You can set the channel. Here I'll go ahead and set uh, cursors on channel 1. And we'll, I'll go ahead and set time cursors. Then I can select cursor A or cursor B. Here's cursor A. And with this little all-purpose knob, I can move cursor A around. You can see it moving here. And over here you see the time for cursor A and the delta time between cursor A and cursor B, which is nice. I can press this button and now I'm moving cursor B. Very simple, very easy to use. And like most scopes today, it will do all kinds of mathematics. It does the basic four arithmetic operations, plus, minus, multiply, and divide. Personally, I never use these except with a rare occasion I'll use the minus operator to calculate the difference between two signals. But it does do FFTs, Fast Fourier Transforms, which we're doing here. We're doing it on channel 1. It gives a split screen, uh, although you can change that and have the FFT displayed as a full screen. And here we see the peak. This is where most of the energy is. I can hit the cursors button again and tell it that I want the, to use the math channel to, for cursoring. And here's cursor A. If I move cursor A here. I can put it right on top of the peak and you can see right there remember that's a 1 megahertz sine wave and sure enough that peak where all the, most of the energy is is it indeed at 1 megahertz. So that's a nice feature. One of the really nice features about the scope is that it includes filters on each of the vertical channels. If I turn the filters on I can select one of four types low pass, high pass, or band pass in this case I'll select here and I can then select the frequency now I have a 20 megahertz sine wave going in if I turn this this filter down way low here's 15 megahertz below the 20 megahertz signal it goes away it's completely filtered out as I crank the filter up then the signal comes back in now as you can see if I do this slowly the uh, Q, or the edge shape, the edge of the filter isn't particularly sharp, but still it's a nice feature to have. It's a little bit confusing because this symbol says to me a low pass filter, and yet the control seems to be having the opposite effect. So I guess you just have to read this a little bit differently. Now I'll point out one of my least favorite features of the scope, if you want to call it a feature. Here we've got a 1 megahertz sine wave going in and as you can see it's jittering around in the horizontal axis. And it took me a while to figure out what's going on but it turns out that if we change the input to a square wave that jitter basically goes away. And so my theory is that there's a little bit of uncertainty on the trigger level. Now it turns out that an awful lot of these low price scopes that I've looked at have the same problem so it's, it's probably just the nature of the beast. What about rise time? That's something that's really important to us digital engineers. Here I've got a square wave going in and it's, I've fed it through a shaping circuit so that the rise time is actually about a nanosecond. What does it look like on the scope? Let me crank the speed up here. We're up for the two and a half nanosecond limit. And you can get a pretty good idea what that rise time is by looking at that, but why not be lazy? I'll go ahead and use the me automatic measurements because they are so nice. Come with a channel 1 and rise time is right here and you can see it's about measuring about two and a half to three nanoseconds 
which for a 100 megahertz scope is astonishing. It's a, that's a great number. So it does a great job in that department. Now I've got a 100 megahertz signal going into the oscilloscope and you can see that the sine wave is a little bit distorted and that of course is because it's a 100 megahertz signal and it's a one gig of samples being taken every second so that there aren't really enough points in there to properly draw a, a correct sine wave. And we can see that when I turn on channel 2 you notice the shape gets even worse and that's because with two channels turned on the sampling rate drops to 500 million samples per second. This is entirely natural and you'd see this on any scope with the same specifications. Here the signal is displaying a sine wave from a very spectrally pure signal generator, 50 megahertz, and it's pretty much what you would expect. As I turn the sweep rate down, slower and slower, we see these artifacts beginning to be displayed in the, on the screen until we get to these lower sweep rates where we get what almost looks like a beat frequency being displayed. As I tune the signal generator just a handful of kilohertz off the 50 megahertz center, we see that the uh, artifacts change enormously. It's obviously not real, and in fact it isn't. This is a result of the digitiza digitization process the signalant is doing, and it's not unique to that oscilloscope. If we look at the Agilent, which doesn't show that effect because it's a much faster scope, it samples at a much higher rate. Uh, but if I crank it down to reduce the sample rate, and I'll just freeze the display, and now crank it back up, you can see the same sorts of artifacts starting to appear there. And the point here is that you really have to know what your test equipment is doing to use it effectively. So what's the bottom line? At $379, I think this is a fantastic value in a scope. You can get cheaper scopes, especially one of the USB scopes like this little analog discovery which is a nice model, but you won't get anywhere near the bandwidth offered by the signalant. And for me at least, I really prefer a bench instrument with separate knobs and its own display rather than cluttering up the PC screen. If 100 megahertz is good enough for your work, I highly recommend this device. So thanks for watching and don't forget to check out lots more videos and over a thousand articles about building embedded systems over at www.ganzel.com.